Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'll just start? Yeah. yeah. Super happy to have uh, Matt Jackson here today, who's a you guys know a pioneer in social choice theory, implementation, learning, and social network analysis. And he'll tell us about uh, the diffusion of microfinance. Great. So thanks, thanks, Adam. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's been great to be here for the last month, and I look forward to the next couple. Um, so this is a, a long-term project with Abhijit Banerjee, uh, Arun Chandrasekhar is here, and Esther Duflo. Um, we've been gathering data now, I guess, for almost six years, and uh, various things are growing out of this. And so I'll, I'll try and give you a flavor for the data as well as, as some of the particulars that we're working on with this. And you know, basic motivation uh, is understanding how network structures in a society affect things like uh, learning, social learning, and information propagation. Um, and one sub-theme here in, in terms of what we'll be trying to analyze is separating out uh, pure access to very basic information in this case, it's going to be about the availability of microfinance from other kinds of influence that, this, that conversations might have between individuals. So uh, someone else can tell me that, that something's available, or they might actually give me an endorsement to say, you should do this, or, or you know, uh, I'd like to have a friend do it with me, and, and things like that. So separating out these kinds of influences in, in the network diffusion process. Uh, in terms of... Big picture, there's sort of two different ways that we'll go, th go at the data. Um, and let me give you a little bit of background of what we're looking at. So we'll be looking in, in uh, a set of villages in Karnataka and in, in southern India, rural villages. Uh, a bank came in. There had not been microfinance in these villages before. A bank came in and started offering loans. They tell a few individuals in each village about the availability and say, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Um, spread the word and, and tell your friends to come. Uh, and then over time, we've, we map out, uh, before they went in, we mapped out social network structures in these villages. And then we have time series on exactly what the diffusion is of the, uh, of the microfinance through the villages. And so we, we can begin to ask questions of how the network structure influences the, the actual diffusion. And so the first part of the talk is going to be looking at basic ne network characteristics and trying to understand what influences the eventual take up. You know, does network density matter? So we have uh, 43 different villages that they actually entered, and these villages vary in the network structures. And so we can look at whether in a, in a network that has more connections, to, do we get more take up and, and more eventual participation? Um, how does it depend on how segregated these villages are? So some, some are more segregated than others. Uh, so we'll look at, at a series of different characteristics. And one thing we're going to focus in on, which hasn't been looked at too much in the previous literature, is exactly how the specific first points of injection, the first people that the bank talks to, uh, matter in terms of this eventual diffusion. So um, you know, we're starting from a small seed. They talk to maybe 8, 10 people in a village. Uh, and then from there, the information spreads, and the question is, does it really matter which people you talk to, or is that enough to just sort of get things snowballing, and then is it the network itself that determines what's going on? So that's going to be sort of the macro view of, of what we're looking at. Um, and then the second part of the analysis is more micro, where then we're trying to understand exactly how information is transmitted and how much interaction individuals have or... or endorsement they, uh, uh, effect we will see between individuals. So we can try and disentangle sort of peer effects into different categories. One which would be just sort of pure information passing. So how much does it matter just that you know that this product's available compared to knowing uh, specific things about it? And the second is, you know, once I'm informed, um, do I react to how many of my friends have, have taken it up? So do, do I somehow get a better feeling about this if I have a lot of friends who take it up? Uh, or am I imitating people? You can imagine a whole series of different reasons why it might matter how many of my friends buy a product as, in terms of why I might. And I'll talk about that in, in a little more detail as we go along. Um, behind the scenes here is something that's always present in these kinds of analyses, uh, homophily. 
And what does that mean? That means that individuals who have similar characteristics are likely to associate with other people with the same characteristics. So um, basically in, in this setting, what this means is that uh, we're, we're likely to have people who have very similar backgrounds being friends with each other. So if we see one person take up microfinance uh, and another person then subsequently right next to them take up microfinance, that doesn't necessarily mean that there was influence from one to the other. It might just mean that since they were very similar, they were likely to do the same things. And so teasing out what's going on in terms of actual information transmission and diffusion is very different from sort of just sorting out the, the characteristics. And so that's always a, a theme that's behind the scenes in terms of network analysis, that nodes that are proximate in the network tend to have a lot of observed and unobserved characteristics that are going to be the same. And so we'll have to be careful just in the analysis to make sure we don't confuse that with, with what's actually going on. Um, sort of three cont contributions here. Uh, so I'll just sort of give you the punchlines before we start in. Um, probably not a great idea in terms of telling jokes, but I think in terms of getting to academic seminars where people don't always let you get through everything, um, it's, it's usually a, a more reasonable thing to do. Uh, so, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, uh, so well, you know, in terms of investigating how the injection points matter, one thing we're going to find is that the, the best predictor of what's actually going on in terms of being most significant and substantial is going to turn out to be the location of the initial points in the network. And in particular, it's going to be an eigenvector centrality measure, which I'll explain exactly what the, uh, conceptually why that might be the right thing. So th that's going to be important. And basically, once you, you look at that, then other kinds of network characteristics are not really going to matter that much. So density is not going to matter. The segregation structures, a lot of these other things aren't going to seem to matter as much as which points you pick initially. Um, then the second part in terms of disentangling the information from the peer effects, we're going to find that information passing uh, is going to be very significant. So it's very important that I'm connected to people who actually pass me information. But once I'm aware of microfinance, how many friends I have who take it up or don't take it up isn't really going to seem to matter. So it's, it's going to seem that, that most of what's going on in the network is just basic information passing of there's, there's loans out there, um, there's going to be a meeting. And beyond that, there's not a significant interaction effect as far as we can tell. Uh, a third part is going to be looking at roles of non-participants in diffusion. So often when people model diffusion, we're, we take sort of off-the-shelf kinds of epidemiology models. So the idea is you know, we'll model it like the flu. Um, you know, once I, I, I take up, then I can tell other people about it. Um, but here we'll also allow non-participants, so people who heard about it but decided for some reason they didn't want to participate, uh, we'll allow them to, to pass that information along as well. Okay. Um, and, and we'll find that the, the information passing by non-participants accounts for roughly a third of, of what's going on in, in both the information and eventual take up. Okay. Uh, so background, uh, the bank originally planned to go into 75 villages in Karnataka, relatively isolated. Um, they entered 43 of them by the end of our data collection in, in 2011 uh, for, for this talk. Um, we surveyed the villages before entry, and then we have a bunch of network structure and various demographics. And then we track microfinance participation over time, and so we get an eventual diffusion, and then we try and see what's going on from that. So the, the nice part about the data are that a lot of diffusion studies will often be one large network. And so here we have sort of a, a reasonably isolated separate networks. And so we can think of doing comparative statics a, across the networks and seeing what's going on there, as opposed to just having, say, you know, a, a one phone uh, company's data or uh, Facebook or you know, some online uh, data set here. We've, we'll have many different ones that allow us to do some comparisons there. Nobody yeah. Is what? Nobody from one village. So there, there's some leakage across villages in the sense that sometimes a person from one village will be married into another village. Um, it appears, as, as we can tell, these villages are, you know, they're on the order of 50 kilometers apart or more. Uh, you know, they, they'll be relatively isolated. It appears that that's not a major effect. So um, th there could be some information leakage across villages. We don't, we're going to treat them as pretty much isolated. I think that's a reasonable first order uh, here. 
Um, and then, you know, in combination with this, then we have detailed information about the loans take up and who took up when and, and so forth. So, so having both of those things together is, is quite useful. Um, we'll also have 13 different types of relationships in each village. And at the end, I'll tell you that, you know, some of these relationships are better predictors of information passing than others. So it's not as if all these relationships are created equal in terms of how useful they are. Yeah, Nicole. Relationships evolve over time also? Um, so uh, good question. We, we have a snapshot of the relationships. So we did the survey just once in terms of the relationships. And, we, and this is survey data, so it's going to have some problems in terms of it's self-reported. Uh, it's not observational. We don't know exactly who they talk to. Uh, we're, we've done subsequent resurveys in all the villages, and then we're trying to take that to, to, uh, to sort of do a before and after picture and see actually whether the availability of loans. So now, since they only entered 43 of the villages, we also have a set of villages that they didn't enter. And we can see if, if the microfinance intervention actually changed the, the networks in some, some way. But here, up to, what I'll show you today doesn't have, it's just one snapshot of the networks, and we'll just take those as fixed. Um, OK. So Karnataka, near Bangalore, um, the villages were basically in uh, you know, an area within a couple of hours of Bangalore. The um, villages are, on average, about 1,000 people per village, about 220 households per village. Um, and then you know, we have a bunch of demographics on the villages. You know, the per capita income here would be a few dollars a day. Um, so they're relatively poor villages. Uh, they were isolated from microfinance before, so the, part of the reason BSS was I interested in entering this is that they didn't have competition in the villages. So, uh, and so the, the survey, what we would do in a, a given village, I can blow this one up, so we would go in and, and survey the village. Um, these uh, dots would be individuals, they're collected into the households. And so for instance here, this question is, if you wanted to borrow 50 rupees for a day, and 50 rupees is about a dollar, um, who would you go to uh, to borrow that? And then so the respondents could, could answer that they would borrow from somebody, and then we would connect um, you know, those individuals. What we're going to work with is aggregate at the household level, because the way in which this process works is that the loans are available to women between the ages of, uh, I guess it's 18 and 57. Um, so, and you can only have one loan per household, so we'll treat the household as the decision maker. Also, we didn't interview all the individuals, so if we aggregate um, to the household level, then we will have more complete information in terms of which households might have interacted with whom. There's a lot of missing data. We know there's missing data um, from two different sources. One is we weren't able to interview all the people in the villages. The other is that there's a l reciprocation rates are, are, are less than unity. So you could ask, you know, who, who do you borrow kerosene from? And then we could also ask, who do you lend kerosene to? And it's not always this, that the person asking, uh, you know, says, I borrow from Ehud, but Ehud doesn't say he lends to me. Um, but also, we, we also, the reassuring thing about that part of the error is that when you look at reciprocation rates among relatives, so you can ask me who my relatives are that live outside the household. I might name somebody as my relative, but they don't necessarily name me. Um, so the reciprocation rates of, are about the same order. So, so there's measurement error here, but it, it appears that it's somewhat random. And there's some corrections we do for some of the statistics, but not all. OK, so we, this is borrowing. Uh, who do you go to temple with? Um, a fairly sparse network in this village. Um, who, who do you ask? Who would you go to for advice? Uh, who comes to you to borrow kerosene? Um, who would you go to for, for medical help? So there's a whole series of different uh, relationships. And what we'll do is from all of these, we build up one network where uh, two households are connected then if there's any of these types of relationships between them. And that means that then they can interact. Okay. So wait, some of these, I mean, the direction of the arrow may mean something different. Yes, indeed. And, and so we're, we're going to, we're, we're just going to aggregate things to say that um, for this particular instance, we're going to think of two households as being connected if they have some of these relationships together, at least in one direction, meaning that they, we believe that that would allow them to have contact. Uh, so what, then, you forget the direction of the then we forget the direction. So we'll, we'll aggregate things to be a non-directional 
and basically there's a, there's a relationship present if any of these questions were answered positively. And uh, we know, in fact, that some of these networks are better. So we've done, re-estimated all this with just subnetworks, and you can do it with weighting, and you can do it with direction. Uh, you can get more power out of it than what we're getting by aggregating everything this way. Um, but if you start, we didn't want to do too, you know, given we only have 43 villages, if we start doing things uh, overfitting in terms of uh, allowing us too much freedom in the design, then, um, uh, yeah, we'd have problems. How did you pick those questions like kerosene or things like that? I mean, yeah, so you know, the idea is that if you, if you go into a village in terms of survey techniques and if you just ask people who are your friends or who do you talk to on a regular basis, it's very difficult to get to people to think of all, the, of all the people. And so if you cue them on very specific different types of tasks, then you're much more likely to get answers because then they think, oh, who, do I, you know, who did I borrow kerosene from? Who do I borrow money from? And all these things. Yeah, so in, in these villages, um, you know, the kerosene is actually something that they'll run out of on occasion, and they're used for heat and cooking and, and so forth. And so you know, part of it is just trying to figure out in their day-to-day -day lives, um, what would they need? And, uh, you know, I guess uh, the, the group that we've been working with have had um, experience in related villages. So designing the questions in terms of what types of things might elicit the best answers um, was, was just sort of going through and... and uh, picking their brains. Okay, and in addition to all this, then we also have a lot of demographics. So age, gender, subcast, religion, profession, education levels, uh, number of family members, and so forth. Um, Self-help group participation. So sometimes these people work in small groups to help borrow and, and uh, lend and, and insure each other. Um, there's, uh, you know, whether they vote, whether they have a ration card. So there's different government programs that they can have access to. Um, you know, basic caste variables, so which, what's, what's the fraction of sort of higher castes compared to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Um, so there's different, you know, listings that we can keep track of. Okay, so, so now I'm just going to go through two different parts of the analysis. The first is this just reduced form part, and then the second part is the structural model of, uh, of fitting. And so um, what's the, you know, in, effect, in figuring out what affects diffusion, what's the thing that we're going to try and take advantage of? So for instance, in trying to figure out what mattered in terms of the initial injection points, the thing that's very nice about it is that the strategy of the bank was as follows. They would go to their employee and say, when you go into this village, we want you to contact the following individuals, teachers, self-help group leaders, and shopkeepers. Okay, so they have a list, and they will go into a village, and they'll try and locate who's the teacher in the village, um, who, who are the shopkeepers, who might be a self-help group leader, and then tell those people about the, the uh, availability that we'll be back and we'll be offering loans. Um, well, as luck would have it, doing the, the fact that they're doing that randomly, sometimes you know, the teacher might be somebody who's very central in a network, and other times the, the teacher might be somebody who's very peripheral. So by chance, by the fact that they're always looking for the teacher, and the teacher can happen to op occupy different places in the social network across different villages, then we can use that to say, okay, in some villages they talk to this person first, in other villages they talk to this person first, then how does that matter in terms of whether the, the microfinance gets taken up? So it seems like they're expecting the teacher or the shopkeeper to tell their customers, being the students or the people buying things about this. And those edges are not in your graphs. Um, right. Uh, well, no. So, so yeah. So they, they're basically thinking that these are people that might talk to other individuals. Um, in the context of their jobs. Yeah. So there's a question of. Like yeah, yeah, where yeah. Where you buy your groceries. Yeah. So, um, so one thing that we have here is, you know, the, uh, the the relationships that we have might not include all the types of interaction relationships that these individuals might have. And so there are certain kinds of, of diffusions of information that we won't have. You know. And another thing to say is, I guess, uh, you know, in a village of 1,000 people, if you live there for most of your life, uh, you probably know everybody by this. <laughs> um, so, so we shouldn't think of these networks as knowledge networks as much as these are, are networks where somebody might be more likely to pass information about loan opportunities to somebody else than than just to, you know, to somebody that they might know in the village. But beyond that, we're not going to control for all the possible different types of relationships and communication possibilities that might be there. Um, 
Yeah. Um, why couldn't they just put on a post or something like that inform all the thousand people in the village at once? Uh, right, so, so there's some questions, you know, there's literacy problems in the villages, first of all, so just writing something on a poster isn't necessarily going to communicate so well in these villages. Um, there's also, you know, part of it is just that, you know, word of mouth communication is, is a reasonable um, way to get, uh, yeah, I mean, everyone wants to. Also, they, they think you're like a Christian converter, <laughs> um, like you've come in to convert people or you're up there with women. Signs like. Public science not not a good thing. Just going public science not like it's just not how it's done. They think you're someone who's come from abroad to convert people, corrupt their women, do other things. There's just a protocol, and the protocol is to approach people in respected positions, and people that are respected in the context of women are the preschool teachers, uh, because all mothers at some point in their life, or their moms or their daughters, or whatever, have interacted with these people. And then shopkeepers where people hang out to get drunk slash coffee. So, uh, <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, the poster route is yeah, yeah. sort of in the norm. Yeah, and one of the reasons the bank was interested in doing this, with allowing us to have some access to this information is figuring out better ways to reach individuals too. So if we can help them figure out what was going on and why, you know, basically what happens is in some villages they get 7% take up, and the highest village is 44%. And you know, that for them, break even has got to be above 20% or so. They need, they need some amount of penetration in order to, to make it worth their while to enter one of these villages. And so they're trying to figure out better ways of getting it. As everyone was pointing out, a poster isn't necessarily a good one. There was a question back there. And then. If simply regressing the participation decision on the household characteristics, then what? Right, so I'll show you sort of how much eventually the, the latter part so household characteristics are going to take care of some explanation so certainly you know how wealthy we are how educated you are um, what your profession is uh, there's going to be a whole series of things which are going to be good indicators of of whether you'll take up and then what we're going to be interested in is is uh, in addition to that how much did the the network structure matter but the demographics certainly influence you know uh, loan take up quite a bit and, kind of justify the heuristic in the sense that teachers, uh, et cetera, tend to be more the eigenvalue central? Yeah, so I'll show you. So I'll sh questions that are even better. Right, right. So, so actually, one thing we're following up on now is trying to figure out how do you identify the people who are best, most central in a village. Uh, and one conjecture is that, that, you, that asking the people in the village um, just directly, who's the, you know, if I want to go to, to somebody to get information out in this village, who should I talk to? Uh, and, and so, so that, that, uh, that you know, I'll, I'll, we'll see eigenvector centrality is, is going to be a good predictor. Just knowing how many connections you have is not a good predictor. And so you need something more than just knowing that, that somebody is, has a lot of friends. You need to know that they're well placed in the village. And, and that's something that intuitively you know, if we think about a department and you wanted to know who would be able to talk to different groups to get information to flow, that's something intuitively you would have in your mind. And even though you might not, you know, if a villager might not know what eigenvector centrality is, they might still be able to tell you, you know, here's a good person to talk to in our village to get information out. So send two volunteers out and tell me, go to your friends, and if they meet in the same house, then... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, send them on a random walk and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Relationships here because if this, if this is a microfinance program that's specifically targeting women, then would you necessarily expect so like two men in the village to actually be like discussing? Yeah, yeah. So so we do have things by gender. A lot of the, uh, we think of we're thinking of the loans as um, household decisions, and even though they're given to women, so part of the idea of these loans is you give them to women so they can make investments in business, and and that is going to help the woman uh, have some ability that they might not have otherwise. Uh, so there, there's whole reasons for giving them to women. Also, women repay at a much higher rate. Um, but uh, so, so there's some reasons for differentiating, and that means that male-male contact might be different than male-female and so forth. We're not going to control for that because we think of these loans, often what happens is the loans are actually used for consumption smoothing and things other than what they would tell the bank. So they might tell the bank, look, I'm going to buy fertilizer for you know, and, and improve our ability to, to farm, or I'm going to invest in a new frame for our silkworm production. 
but instead then they use it to you know to pay for a wedding or um, you know something else and and so we, we th we'll think of these as household decisions rather than uh, but but we're we're going to abstract away from a lot and in, in doing this um, yeah have you looked at how much this is sort of a cascade versus a spread so there's this recent analysis of Facebook spreading and things like that where they find that a lot of things which we think as viral spreading is actually usually just one or two hops and that you yeah. don't really have this long cascade. So very, very good. Um, in fact, when we, look at the, when we look at things, when we look at the, the data, um, after two to three hops, most of what happens will happen in these villages. And what tends to happen is when you look across the villages, there'll actually be, uh, um, there's a fairly wide variation. So it's not like a, a norm, you know, a bell curve. It's the villages either end up with little spread or, or more spread. It's a much flatter distribution. So indeed, it does have some aspects of that. We'll model, the diffusion process that we model will actually have those properties, even though it doesn't, uh, it, we're not modeling it at, at, at that as such. But the, the kind of process we'll, we'll look at will actually exhibit those properties. And, and it might be interesting to talk a little more afterwards about why, why this process might exhibit that, um, that kind of property. Okay, so um, this, this reduced form, so uh, centrality, so we're you know, if think, trying to think of the most central person in, in a network. Obviously, the, the basic way you do this is just count a uh, number of connections. You know, so what's the degree of this node? Seven, well, they have seven friends, six here. These would be the people you might want to talk to because they have the most connections. Um, the, you know, the, that kind of idea of, of initially contacted points uh, leading to higher participation or higher diffusion goes back very, very uh, deep in the sociology literature. Katz and Lazarsfeld on opinion leaders, Coleman, Katz, and Menzel. There's, there's a lot of theory to suggest that that should be important. And you know, intuitively, obviously, if you, if you pick somebody with more connections than fewer, all else held equal, that would be better. Um, now, you know, the problem with just looking at degree is obviously it doesn't cap capture how well somebody pl is placed in the network. So these individuals both have two friends, but obviously this individual who then has, you know, is friends with the seven and the six is much better placed and, and has a higher centrality in the, in the way that we would want to diffuse information than this individual out here who's, who's sort of on the edge of the network and is connected to two twos. So the idea is then how do you capture a notion like that? And the standard technique in, in terms of the network literature is to look at, at what's known as eigenvector centrality. Um, and so the idea here is that the centrality of, of node i should be pr proportional to the sum of the friends' centralities. So if you give me more friends, that's going to be better. But if you also give me more central friends, that's better. Right? And so it's the total centrality of my friends that, that determines how central I am. Well, of course, now this is self-referential, right? So it's just going to be uh, a, a set of equations and unknowns, and then you want to solve this. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so what we end up with is then just a, you know, we can write this as a matrix. So a vector is equal to the, if we're thinking about G, I, J being the adjacency matrix where this is one if I and J are connected to each other and zero otherwise, then we can just write this as the, the centrality is the eigenvector, um, the principal eigenvector in this case of, of uh, the adjacency matrix. And you know, if you use Perron for Banius, so there's a nice theory here that suggests that there's going to be one uh, eigenvector that's going to be the one associated with the largest eigenvalue that's going to have non-negative entries and, and be, make sense as the solution to this set of equations. So generally, this is a well-defined measure. Um, and uh, as, as Adam was just pointing out, this is closely related to Google PageRank. So originally, when they thought about trying to figure out how to rank web pages, the way in which they were doing this was thinking of how, you know, how well are you connected, who is linking to you in terms of which other pages, and you wanted pages that had high page rank in order to, and I think is, page does not refer to web page, which I thought originally did, it's, it's Larry Page, yeah, Larry Page rank. Well, it's, actually, um, it's normalized differently because the Google page rank is a random walk, so you don't have the adjacency matrix, but the adjacency matrix multiplied by one over the degree matrix. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. So, so I randomly pick, depending on how many neighbors I have, I randomly, and that's related to this random surfer model as well, right? So, yours is if is, I have more na so one way of not getting a lot from you is if you have a lot of friends in PageRank, whereas 
in right. this model, if you have a lot of friends still, I get just one unit from you. Exactly, exactly. So, so here, we're, we're assuming that if I have more friends, I talk to each, I, I don't stop talk, I, I don't talk to them, to each one less, um, which might not be a great. So actually, there might be better measures in terms of, uh, of alternative centrality measures, and we have a couple in mind um, based on uh, the model that we'll work with later. Uh, Okay, so, so what does eigenvector centrality do in this setting? Um, you know, here then you can see that it picks up that this one is essentially three times more central than the other one, and it's doing that by the weights of the connections and, and so forth. So it, it gives you a different idea of which nodes be, would be the ones that you want to hit. Um, now, one thing to say about this, uh, suppose that you, now you, you go into this network and you want to pick out um, three nodes to hit as the ones you want to diffuse information. Uh, it's not obvious that the three that you would want to pick would be the three with the highest you know, eigenvector centrality. So you might not just go to, the, to these three because these two are connected and, and right? So, so the actual problem of figuring out which ones you'd want to pick for diffusion, if you can just pick eight or 10 people to talk to in a village, it's not necessarily just you know, find the ones with the highest eigenvector centrality. Um, that's actually an NP-hard problem, I think, finding you know, K nodes out of N nodes for, to, optim to optimize diffusion is going to be a hard problem. But um, in any case, that's the problem that the bank is facing in terms of what they're doing. Okay, so second hypothesis, if initial contacted points have eigen eigen eigenvector centrality, then there should be more participation. Um, and there's some, some theory on this, but not much. The diffusion model that you have in mind when you're saying it's an NP-hard problem? Yeah, so that's, there's a paper by uh, David Kempe and... Tard yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. And, and it, it, it does depend on exactly what you assume about the diffusion process in terms of, of what the optimal set of points are. And there are some for which it's going to be easier than others. Um, and I don't remember exactly the, it was a probabilistic model in their case, which isn't too different from what we're going to look at, but I don't remember the specifics of the, of the process that they looked at it for, for that particular result. Yeah. So their model would not fit the Facebook data because it would predict sort of longer cascades. L longer. So at least sort of when people look at the social networks, you need to assume, I mean, in particular, they sort of just do assume independent probability and sort of just sort of Poisson events more or less, and you need long tail distributions for the number of children to see this more funny effect. The funny fat tails that you see in the cascade process you're talking about on Facebook, yeah. Okay. But it's probably even harder to model those. Model those, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so let's have a peek at these two hypotheses. So uh, first one, let's just look at the degree of the leaders that they ma managed to hit. So how connected were the leaders? And so here is the take up, these are 43 different villages. The lowest, again, 7%, highest, about 44%. And then this is the, you know, when the, the leaders that they happened to hit, how, how many connections did the leaders have on average? Um, and that goes from you know, roughly 12 up to about 28. And you don't see, a, I mean, it's not even a positive relationship. So, so it's insignificant and in, in pointing in the wrong direction um, in terms of, of what the, that basic hypothesis would have predicted. This Nicole? data looks pretty bad given what you indicated that they need at least 20% take up to uh, break even. Right, so you know when you think, I mean that, that's a crude rule of thumb. So you know the so what's the um, so the loans are uh, pay very high interest rates, somewhere between twenty eight and thirty eight percent per annum. They're one year loans. The repayment rates are on the order of ninety eight to one hundred percent. So they get a lot of payback. The problem is that there's a big fixed cost of going into a village. So if you have to go back every two weeks and you're sending somebody in and these are small amounts in terms of the loans, then you just need to make sure you're doing high, volume, high enough volume. And so indeed, part of the reason that, they're, that, they're, that things aren't great for them is, and they're trying to get higher take up is going into a you know, 220 household village and managing only to get five or 10 households to participate means it's not necessarily worth your while to keep going back into those villages. So if they can get higher participation, then it's just extra, it's you know, pure, uh, profit margin for them to, to get additional households. And so, so that's the reason that they're, they're, they're trying to, yeah. Is it, does the end participation rate or does it keep on going up 
Um, so the, this is the end participation rate for each village as of the data that we've connect, uh, collected. It's possible that over time additional people will continue. And the villages, you know, a lot of the activity happens in the first three trimesters or so, so first year. Um, but there's, there is continued activity beyond that, but not as much. Uh, so, you know, things seem to move pretty quickly and then die out after a while. You're not getting additional people. But it's possible that there'll be more people in, in future years. If it's the future of information, shouldn't everybody eventually learn about the um, it depends, I guess, right? And so some of these villages, so part of it, you know, in a, in a village where only a few of the people take out loans, uh, it's possible that the, that the information doesn't spread that widely, right? That, that, that there's just a few households who take out loans and not that many people in the village actually really know that the, that the bank was here and that, uh, you know, that, that, these, that some of my friends took out loans. Yeah. Oh. Matt, did you say it's the same number of contact people in each village regardless of size? Um, it's not exactly, so there's some randomness in how many people they hit, and there's some variation there. So, uh, so and we, like this, we should kind of think of the village size. Yeah, yeah, so we've done, we've, we've read, uh, I'll show you some regressions and we can control, uh, I don't have those regressions here, but we've controlled for the number of leaders and then we've renormalized the eigenvector centrality measures and so forth. It doesn't appear that, that the, the, the number of people that... The number of people total, like the denominator for your y-axis? Oh, the, the, yeah, so the number, of, the number of households does matter in terms of what the take-up is. And so in villages uh, with, um, so actually here, if you look at the number of households, the more households in the village, you tend to get a slightly lower uh, take-up rate. Is it that you're not expanding the number of initial nodes along with this? It's, it's, it's exactly. So, so you do get a slightly lower um, take-up rate there. Yeah, exactly. So uh, just a yeah. question. Is there a way to control whether uh, people fear that the loans are uh, fixed in number and the more people know about uh, it, good, good question. is uh, that they get one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So one thing is, um, and we've actually got another project we're working on where there is a, there's a competition effect and the, the, if the more other people participate, the less available something might be for me if there's a fixed number of them. Here the bank is actually more than happy to take as many people who come. They, they basically turn away very, very few people. Uh, because you know the pay, repayment rate's so high, and and they're just getting extra profit margin from each loan, so they might not know that. So we can't control what they actually think about it, and whether they, some of them were reticent to tell others because of that. We're going to treat this as just once I know, I'm I'm going to tell my neighbors with some probability, and uh, we won't go into that strategic aspect, but it could have been there in in their minds. Um, yes. How much heterogeneity is there uh, with respect to the loan size of different households? Um, from the size of different households? Uh, I don't remember what the... Loan size of different Oh, the loan sizes. No, so the introductory loans here are all on the order of uh, 10,000 rupees per year. So what they do is they start with a certain size loan and it's, it's pretty much uniform. And then if, you, you know, if you've taken, if you've gone through several cycles of loans, then you can begin to you know, to sort of earn a credit rating and then they'll adjust things upward and so forth. But the starter loans are basically all fairly uniform in terms of the, the way that they, they offer here. Yeah. Okay, so here when you look at the eigenvector centrality of the leaders on average, uh, and then look at this, um, you know, there's a, a couple of outliers, but basically you're getting a, a strong and, and positive relationship. And roughly one standard deviation increase in how central these in, initial points are in terms of the eigenvector centrality gives you about a 15% increase in the participation rate. So, so you know, there, it's a substantial rate. And when you look at it here, so you get, you know, this is, when you look at mi microfinance participation regressed on these different possible things, you're finding eigenvector uh, of the leaders is statistically significant, and it's a large effect in terms of, you know, relatively large in terms of uh, actually mattering for, for their pickup. Yeah. Given that they didn't randomly select somebody, this means that uh, in communities where the teacher is central, there's going to be higher take-up. Yeah, yeah. So, so there could be, you could think of a story, so, you know, what we've got here is a correlation. And there could be some other story that, that somehow when shopkeepers, teachers, and self-help group leaders are, are, have eigenvector centrality, then that means that your village has some characteristic which is likely to lead to high take-up. Uh, and we can't control. What we can do, uh, I can show you, is look at eigenvector centrality of the leaders 
and try and correlate that with anything about the villages. So these are, the, you know, what's the average age in a village, education level, fraction of the forward casts, um, savings rates, you know, how many people participate in self-help groups, number of beds is sort of a wealth measure, whether there's electricity in house. You can put in a bunch of things. You don't really seem to anything, you know, there's a couple of things that occasionally pop up, but then disappear once you, so it doesn't appear that there's any really strong thing that this is proxying for. Um, it, you know, it, it appears that this is really, and once you, if you go in and, and you, you, know, you put an eigenvector centrality leader and put in a bunch of other variables, this still stays on the same order of magnitude and statistically significant. And no matter what you seem to throw at these, you know, added in terms of other variables, it's still picking up a substantial residual on the same order of magnitude. So it seems to be fairly robust that this is, you know, that it's really these injection points. And, you know, and logically, it seems, it, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, you know, uh, let's see, in, in order of time, you can throw a lot of other network variables at it. Nothing else seems to really matter. Um, so when you put in all these, you know, put in your favorite clustering measure, path distance, and so forth, you're not going to seem to pick up much else. Okay. How are your eigenvectors normalized? Um, so the eigenvectors here, we normalized, uh, um, so let me think of the precise, uh, so um, we're looking at the eigenvectors relative to uh, an average eigenvector number in the village. So it's, it's, it, we did it with averages, right? So it's... Uh, um, so it's L1 normalized. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we also tried... Uh, what was the other way we did? We, we did a, um, a, a number... So there was a, a second way we did it to try and account for village size. So the, the number of individuals which can affect the eigenvector centrality. Um, but we, that correction didn't seem to make any difference. Uh, yeah, like the L1 normalization team say that you're getting this, the getting good high diffusion in the villages where the leaders are more central than other people, right? Like it's not like there was a comparison in the centrality of individuals in different networks. Um, right, across, yeah, exactly, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a question, but uh, sorry, I didn't understand. So did you start with this hypothesis and then you verified it or did you kind of come across this after you had the data? And then um, so we had several hypotheses and actually one of the hypotheses we originally started with was we thought the degree distribution would make a big difference uh, and that didn't pan out at all. Um, and then we also thought, you know, what, what are the things we might want to look at? One is degree distribution, the other is sort of an expansion property or reach, third was segregation properties and then the other was the initial injection points. And out of those, the initial injection points were the only ones that, that seemed to matter. And the other ones, which all have good theory behind them, don't seem to matter. And I think that part of the reason they don't matter in these villages, the, the, the guess is, that these villages are all sort of connected enough that you know, whether you, you're, you're sort of increasing the, the degree distribution a little bit or so forth isn't really the main determinant. But if you hit somebody who just doesn't have many connections compared to somebody who has a lot of connections, that makes a much bigger difference and that the rest of the variation is all within a band that's not one that's going to be consequential. Um, is there some infection model where you could actually get the numbers correct? So you could say this corresponds to an infection rate of... Uh, yeah, so what we'll do is actually... So um, what we'll do is build our own infection model. So let me just quickly take you through that in the last few minutes of, of what the model that we worked with was. And this model is sort of a standard contagion model, but uh, with a slight variation to it, well, two important variations to it. So what we'll do is, is we're going to have, you know, so we initially inform a few nodes. We could think of those as the initially infected nodes, right? And now they can tell their neighbors. And what we'll do is we'll have informed nodes repeatedly tell other people about the availability of microfinance. And then once you're informed, then you have a choice of whether to take up or not. And you can make your decision then based on, on what you know about the, your friends taking up. Um, so in particular, let me just sort of go to the picture of this. I think it's probably easiest. So you know, there's a network out there. The bank comes in and hits a few of these uh, initial points, the self-help group leaders, teachers, shopkeepers, and so forth. So let's suppose they hit two of them. 
one chooses not to participate, one chooses to participate. So we'll allow them, based on our demographics, we can statistically estimate, you know, what's your likelihood to take up a loan based on the observed leaders and so forth. So one participates, one doesn't. And now what we'll do in terms of the infection, the uh, transmission probability, is each one of these individuals will now randomly tell some friends about this in the next period. And they do this in an independent manner. Each friendship I activate with a probability, and we'll have one probability for the green node, and we'll allow a different probability for a red node. So if I chose not to take up microfinance, maybe I'm just not excited about it, I don't tell any of my friends. If I'm uh, somebody who, who took it up, maybe I'm very excited about it, I tell more people. So it'll allow for different probabilities based on my own experience, and, th and then I tell people. So here, this person maybe is excited about it, they tell three friends. This person is not so excited about it, they only tell one friend. Now these individuals are all informed, they make decisions. These people, what we'll do is we'll allow them, so now I'm informed, uh, this person has a friend, has two friends, you know, one of which participated. This person has a friend who, sorry, this one participated, this one didn't. That, didn't. So we'll allow these two people to react differently based on the fact that their friends made different choices. So if there's a peer effect, if there's some sort of endorsement effect, you might think that this person would have a higher probability of taking up than this person because they've gotten uh, some sort of positive feedback from this friend who, who's endorsing it. And so if I had you know, three green friends, then I might be even more likely to take it up than somebody with just one green friend and so forth. So we'll allow that to, to go on and then we'll, we'll try and estimate that. Yeah. Actually, maybe there are some positive externalities going on because one of the networks you described is who is that person I would uh, feel comfortable taking a loan from. So maybe if there is a participant that I don't need to take a... Yes, yeah, exactly. So you could imagine even a negative effect um, sort of, if this person takes up a loan, maybe I don't need to because I can borrow from them. Negative. Exactly. So, so the fact, so we can allow that, that parameter be negative instead of positive. So what we'll try and do is estimate a, a parameter and the positive effect would be, oh, more friends doing it, I want to do it too. The negative effect would be lots of friends taking out loans, I'll, I'll just borrow and free ride. Um, even the probability of the red guy can be even higher than the yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's, that's something we'll allow in the specification, and in particular, the way we're going to do this is the log odds that I'll participate will depend on, you know, there's an intercept term plus my characteristics, and then I can also have it be some function here of how many of my friends took up, but this parameter could be positive or negative. So if it comes out to be negative, then we're seeing the effect you're thinking of where my neighbors take up and, and I say, uh, no, I'm going to, yeah, yeah, I'll just use them. And if my neighbors don't take out loans, then I'm forced to take out a loan myself. Whereas if this is positive, then it's sort of the more my friends take it up, the more I, I'm anxious to do it myself. So we have these two things. These, so now we have three parameters that we're really interested in estimating. What's this parameter of, of this peer effect, this interaction endorsement effect? And then what are these two probabilities of passing? Okay, so those are the three key parameters. And then we can also estimate, you know, how does this just depend on your characteristics? Does it, you know... And do you continue... So if, if in round, in round, do you do this in rounds, or how do you do Yeah, it? so we'll do this in rounds. And in rounds, and do the participants of, first round, of the first round continue emitting? Yeah, so, right, exactly. So, so the way in which this will work is these people pass information, these people make choices. Um, now, anybody who's informed can still pass. So this person can inform new people still. And these people can inform people and so forth. So it continues, the process of information passing continues throughout different ranges. So eventually every neighbor of somebody who knows. Could, find out. could find out. Yeah, but it, it also depends sort of, you know, this person might never find out just by chance. Because we're going to run this, uh, you know, we run it roughly three to eight periods per, in terms of the, that seems to be about the right number um, of iterations based both on an estimation procedure and number of trimesters. Um, but so some people might never hear. And that's sort of how this process can really sort of die out is, is you know, it could just stop and a bunch of reds and then nothing continues on and it, it all dies. And so then the way we fit this is we're going to estimate, you know, we can estimate the characteristics from the initially informed. So how, do you, you know, how does your decision depend on uh, that? We've got, you know, enough initially informed people to pick out a lot of the characteristic estimation. Then the rest we just do by, by actually simulating 
on each network what would happen for each choice of parameters. So we'd work on a grid, pick your parameters, simulate the model, look at the actual distributions of the informed, and then see how well that matches the actual data. And we'll just use a series of moments from the data. So you know, how, what's the fraction of people who actually took up in the data? What's the fraction of people at distance one from a leader, distance two from a leader, and so forth? So we'll just use a, a, essentially a simulated method of moments to, to estimate these parameters. In the data, you, you find that people at different positions in the network take different amounts of time before they start to take up? Yes. Is, is that something you can put in here? Like, or I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. How fast do you imagine this diffusion happening in the simulated model? Yeah, so, uh, so in fact, um, you know, again, most of the diffusion takes place fairly rapidly. So after... Yeah, I don't know if it's like, is it a time step a day or is it a year? It's a trimester, so it's, it's four months in the data. Um, and, uh, and what we did was we, we, we fixed this to be four month time periods from the date of initial. And then some, some villages had fewer, so the, the bank didn't enter all the villages at different times. So sometimes they entered you know, several years ago and then other times maybe just one year ago. And so we'll have different amounts of data for different ones and that allows us to sort of see the diffusion process in action. We can also do this by allowing this to be an endogenous variable. If we allow it to be endogenous, it actually comes out between, say, five and seven. So it comes out in a similar range. Um, so you, we, we can instead just, you know, make that a choice variable, allow and simulate and find out how many rounds we need to best match, match the data. And, and when we do that, we end up with something more or less on the same order of magnitude and same fits uh, is what we get. Okay, so what happens? Uh, the order in which people picked it up? Yes, so we, we know the dates at which every, the people picked it up. We can't be sure that this is the process that, that actually went on, but we do know, you know, node by node, we'll have, you know, so the bank gave us information that so-and-so started a loan on, uh, you know, April 5th, and then so-and-so um, did one. So we, we'll know the first dates for different households of the loan, and then we can match that up with the... Uh, compare your, your generated data to actual life, you take into account the order of events. Uh, yeah, when we're trying exactly so so we do try and match so some of the moments that we're trying to fit are um, You know well, we the, we actually don't do time dates on the matching, but we do the uh, you know People that are further away from the initial nodes take up at lower rates And then we try and make sure that the data that we generate have people further away taking up at rates that are comparable to people further away in the actual network so we do it by network distance, not by, by actual calendar time. Yeah. And that lets us see if the time path we generate from our model looks like the real time path, because we didn't use it. Yeah, yeah, so we, we actually don't explicitly use that. And, then, and, and one thing that we also do is we try and fit an alternative model where you just do you know, further away in the network, um, uh, you take up with a lower rate and try and see how well that model does and whether it adds anything to this and it doesn't seem to add any. So once we've done all this, then adding other kinds of things like that doesn't seem to pick up anything else. So, so one thing I didn't quite get on the last slide is um, the initially informed people could also be influenced by information they've had from other people. Uh, do you handle that because you're looking at the time and you're careful? To oh, no. So the initially informed, we, we just, they, they don't have any peers who have taken up. So the first nodes, um, that are, when they make their decisions, basically, the, they're making them simultaneously. And so whether or not they take up, we don't allow them to, to actually depend on, uh, on what the other, even if I'm connected, say we're, we're you know, you're a, a teacher and I'm a self-help group leader, uh, maybe we're connected to each other, we both get told in the first period, um, now we treat our, our de decisions as independent decisions. I, I understand that you, you do in the model, but in terms of the data, it's possible that I was influenced by somebody. I yeah, yeah, it is, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, so, you know, we had to make a lot of simplifying assumptions just to get a model that we can run. It seems that this one does pretty well in terms of the actual fits, but there's a, a lot of richness that we could add that would be more realistic. Okay, so what do we end up with? Um, if I'm a non-participant, I pass information to about one out of 20 times on average to a given friend in a given period. That seems like a low number, but it actually is still statistically significant, and it will turn out to matter in terms of the eventual diffusion. Um, if I'm a participant, I'm much, you know, more than 10 times more likely 
Uh, so I'm about 55%. Both of these are highly significant. The standard errors um, are calculated by bootstrap methods that are fairly conservative. Um, the peer effect comes out slightly negative. So indeed, a little bit negative, but insignificant. So it doesn't appear that once we correct for the fact that I've heard about things, then what my neighbors are doing doesn't seem to have a, a very substantial influence on, on what I'm doing. And if we drop that out and re-estimate things, you know, we get things more or less on the same order of magnitude so that the, the, these inflate a little bit to take care of that, but uh, not by much. Um, one thing that's important to sort of emphasize, um, the way that pure effects analyses are often done, at, at least in economics and in sociology, uh, would normally be you, you look at, at behaviors of individuals, you don't really look at no, network structure, and you regress what I do on, on my friends and peers. And then if I see a positive effect, I say that there's some influence, uh, you know, I can control for as much as I want. If we did just that here, without controlling for the information passing, you would get a very high positive correlation because it would look like I'm acting in response to my peers, partly because if I have a lot of, in, it, what's happening is actually, if I have a lot of informed people, they're telling me with high probability that it's very likely that I get informed, which then allows me to participate. If I don't have many friends who are taking up, I, I wouldn't ever be informed, and so I wouldn't end up hearing about it. And so what this says is it's not really a peer effect in, in terms of endorsement as much as it's really just getting the information out, just making sure that people are aware of it, and that's what's going through the network. Um, and then, you know, you can do a uh, zero out this, so you can zero this out and then see what happens. Um, so let's suppose that we force people who don't participate to not talk to their friends. We can re-simulate the models and see what happens. And if you allow them to talk, as in the fit of the model, about 86% of the population would end up, on average, being informed. About 21% on average participate. So these are in line with the data. Now you force these people not to talk. Even though they don't talk at that higher rate, you, they still matter a lot. You would, you would see a dramatic reduction in terms of how, how informed the population was, and you would reduce the population. So here it means that these sort of carriers, these non uh, participants are still important conduits of information, even though they do it at a lower rate. There's lots of these people, and so that makes a difference. Shouldn't you then uh, correct for that? Say, if I put this to zero, then I could put QP to 5.5 to correct for that, so that you get the same. Well, here what we're trying to do is a counter, uh, you know, sort of a counterfactual, which just says, let's suppose that what, what, what all we want to do is figure out if the model operates the way it does. How, much, how important are these particular individuals? So keeping everything else in the model fixed in terms of the co uh, communication, how much information passing eventually came from these particular individuals? So if we just shut off these links, what would happen? We shut off the links from the non-participants, but keep all the other ones exactly as they were. That's the sort of counterfactual we're interested in, not necessarily what the re-estimated would be. Because we're, it's not an estimation question we're after, it's just sort of, in this particular society, how important are these individuals? But if I wanted to know how good the model is, I would try to fit one model with this equation. Yeah, yeah, so we could do, right, so that's a separate thing, which is a question of, of model fitting. And then you can do a whole series of, uh, of analyses um, and nest the model and try and figure out how, uh, how much uh, ac actual prediction power we're getting out of this rather than, uh, yeah, yeah, that, and that's a different question. We have a whole series of analyses of nesting the model. This model seems to do much better than, uh, than pulling that out. If you pull the P B peer out, that doesn't seem to, you know, that, um, that's not a big consequence in the model. Oh, okay, uh, I should probably conclude. Um, so, so basically, injection points matter substantially. A lot of other network characteristics don't seem to matter. Um, so this just suggests that we do need more theory on how initial points influence eventual diffusions, and especially since it's a difficult problem trying to figure out if there's something, at least heuristics, that we can develop on that. Uh, disentangling information from complementarities. It appears that information passing is very significant and just making sure that people are aware. Um, the peer effects don't seem to play out once we've corrected for that, but non-participants are still important. Um, and then, you know, general points, uh, you know, 
networks do matter here, it, it, but, but in a very specific way. And in terms of diffusion modeling, um, you know, it's important to sort of separate out different kinds of effects and having this kind of model that separates these things, I think, is, is a useful step in that direction. Yeah, okay. It looked like, kind of like the pair effects were very noisily estimated, but I couldn't really tell like, how to think, interpret the standard error. Like, so do you have similar results where you take the counterfactuals of like putting the pure effect coefficient at the bottom of the 95% confidence interval and at the, or even like oh, the, uh, the top? And see how much that changes the rest of the... How many people take up, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we've done that, no. So you want uh, the condition on how it changes from... Sorry, yeah, I guess I like, wonder, because it yeah. seemed like... Like there was a right, no, no, I, I know they, are, they are substituting. You did so, so that bumps it from, I think the average of the average X's if you valued it is something like 20, 26 percent participation, and if you bump it up to the max, like two times that standard error, uh, the, the the lambda one, and then you move everyone's fraction of informed people that also participated one standard deviation in that, we that moved it up from like 26 percent. 25% to something like 28%. Okay, that's so, really so that, that's, yeah, so we have that sitting somewhere. That's the order of magnitude. Yeah, lots, lots of questions here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No. So it, it seems interesting as a future direction to see what happens if there is some kind of a competition effect. If you have two banks who are competing. Oh, whether, two different banks. Uh, uh, and then see what are the, yeah. I mean, whether still eigenvector would be the right thing to do or yeah. any other. Yeah, and actually there's a lot of competition. So w once it became clear that you're getting very high repayment rates, there's been enormous entry into the markets in, in some of the other states, especially in southern India, and, uh, and all kinds of problems with competition as well. Um, but understanding competing diffusion processes is certainly very relevant. There's a few papers that are trying to do this in very, very basic models. But it's, it, it's clearly an important problem from understanding product diffusion in general. So usually uh, in these rural areas, is it the case that when a bank enters, it's one, or is it a few? I, it, in some of the villages, it's by many. You know, it's, it's almost like credit cards. Once you realize that you can get a lot of, uh, you know, there's high profit margins on credit cards, then they start coming after you. And it takes a while before they start entering. And, and they do things like, you know, we'll come in and we'll consolidate all your loans and, you know, take out one loan from us and we'll repay all your previous loans. And um, there's been scandals about, people coming in and taking advantage of individuals in some of the villages. Not these villages in particular, but in other areas. So one would expect that it's going to proliferate. Uh, yeah, I would anticipate that. Uh, so it seems like your policy recommendation to the bank would now be uh, target the people with high eigenvector centrality, which might not be such a useful policy recommendation if they don't have the social network. So now what they should do is go in and serve it to this like expensive survey process by which they construct the social network, then figure out the yeah. centrality measures, and then... Right, right, right. So once they've done that, then they might as well just knock on every door and just tell them about the... the right, so if I'm going to actually survey the network. And so that was... Say, what, what, I made a comment, a cryptic comment, I guess, at first. One, one thing that we believe is that... Or uh, hypothesize is that actually asking people within a village who the people are that are the most central. So you just go in, you, you start talking to people, and you say, OK, who is it in the village that I should talk to if I want to get information out about a financial product or about a new product? Um, and, and so that they, they might actually be able to tell you, even though they have no idea what eigenvector centrality is, they might still be able to tell you very accurately, look, it's so-and-so. It would be great for getting, you know, they're really well, really well connected, and well connected would mean. So we're doing it right now. We're actually surveying. So in the resurvey, we just added a week ago, we just added this set of questions on that. Um, and hopefully, we'll get some interesting answers out to see whether they're able to pick out how well do people really be able to, to, to tell you that. Yeah. So they, um, you have this first point that the network is dense enough that these statistics don't seem to matter. But I'm curious, how, how far does uh, informedness spread in your Simulations yeah, so in the, in the simulations, it's about 85 percent, but there's a there's a large variation in that. So some villages it spreads much less; it dies out pretty quickly. And ones where you don't get much participation among the original. Uh, so if you look at the the initial injection points, if none of your injection points take up, and they're each passing with probability say 0.1 or 0.05, 
then you can actually get not that much eventual, you know, so things, so, so there's some variation in this. Many people become informed, it really depends on the, on the decision of the initial. Like, yeah, so, it's, it's, so their eigenvector centrality and their decision actually does make a difference, As, especially in this model. It, it really bumps things up because then you're getting much higher, you know, those initial points then start, suddenly start spreading things with much higher probability and then things take off. Yeah. Yeah, Adam? Other policy implications are like, you might think that the bank might try try to get people to adopt, give them incentives to adopt, rather than just to spread the word, and that that might actually not be that useful. Or you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You don't think, think they might try. Right, right, right. Because here there's a big bump, and uh, being a participant might get somebody to talk much more. And yeah. so if you you get a few people somehow with reduced rates or something initially teaser rates, then that's a good way to start right. um, to to get that, to change that initial. That's a very good idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You don't have causality, though, for the participation. Maybe just that the guys who are participating are also very happy to talk about it, and inducing them to participate will not help you. That's true. We, do, we, we, don't, we have a correlation here and not a causality. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, now that you're serving people again, are you asking them about whether they're informed about the loans? Yeah, so actually what we're doing now is uh, we are, we're running a series of more controlled experiments. <laughs> So initially when the bank went in and did, they picked the points somewhat at random and so forth, now we know the villages. We, we're redoing things with a, an experiment where we can control exactly what information people have, um, who's told initially. We can vary it according to eigenvector centrality, according to other centrality measures, and then seed particular information. And then when people come to us, ask them, who did you hear about this from? What did you hear? Um, and try and trace social learning. So we're doing a much more controlled experiment to try and address a whole series of things that we weren't able to control for here. Yeah, yeah we should probably uh, be close to Your approach is to go after an aggregate measure of, of influence with this model last week here, uh, which is actually quite common in the economists. Uh, yeah. Literature, I, guess. I, I guess my question is, um, another approach is to actually consider the pairwise interaction between agents and have like different interaction uh, coefficients for each possible pair. Have you looked at the data whether, you know, have you seen any, any kind of patterns in which there's specific pairs yeah. of interaction in the sense that if, if George adopts yeah, 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 yeah. a finance product, then George will follow it. Yeah, no, so, so we haven't, I mean, what we, we have done is we've tried reweighting these things by say, I can, instead of just taking the average of my neighbors, re-rate it by eigenvector weights or some other weights of their network position. We can do it also by proximity. So if we're more similar, then I pay more attention to you. And if we're less similar, we pay less attention. Um, you know, at some level, we want to be careful that we don't want, we don't want to throw too many. It, actually, in terms of computation, we had servers running both at Stanford and MIT to, to get and you know we we probably caused some email outages at, at, uh, um, in terms of you know just running the the number of iterations to to get one of these um, f to to get the fits. So uh, it seems very data intensive, and the more parameters we put in, the more difficult it is in terms of running all the simulations across the villages. But it's it's useful to sort of think of what succinct ways we could put that, that kind of information in. Yeah. Great. I think we're going to have some snacks. You can ask Matt questions there if you want. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.